Right, we'll make a start. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the 2016 Hammerson full year results. Monday morning, half term ended, but hopefully you'll see some pleasing results from the company. In line with our usual agenda, I'm going to take you through some of the highlights. It's been a good year for the business, and you're going to hear some more detail on our strategy, which has delivered that result. Next, Hyman's going to talk you through the numbers, and then he and I will come back and take you through the portfolio updates before opening up for your questions. So turning to slide three, it's clear that 2016 has been both an eventful and successful year. It's worth reinforcing the point that our strategy and portfolio mix is designed to produce consistently positive income performance, even against the backdrop of an uncertain economic and political climate. In that respect, I'm pleased that we continue to deliver on our strong track record of sector-leading earnings and dividend growth, with earnings per share up 8.6% and dividend per share up 7.6%. Net assets per share improved 4.1% and like-for-like net rental income increased 3.2%, including our outlets portfolio. And during the year, we increased our presence in prime retail destinations, cementing our leadership with new centres in Dublin and Birmingham and delivering stunning new development schemes in Leeds and Southampton. We materially increased our strategic exposure to the fast-growing premium outlet sector, increasing our stake in value retail to 40%. And the acquisitions for VIA outlets added five new centres, taking this platform to more than 1 billion euros, achieving critical mass on a European-wide scale. The premium outlet sector now accounts for close to one-fifth of our total portfolio. We raised over £1.2 billion to refinance our acquisition facility and further reduce the cost of debt for the business. And we exceeded our 2016 disposals target, selling £635 million from across the portfolio as part of our ongoing capital recycling strategy, leaving the business well positioned to fund our future high growth projects. So in summary, an active year successfully delivering on all fronts. Now, I said I'd give you a bit more detail on the strategy behind the results. Firstly, our retail markets are experiencing fast evolving trends as depicted by the black line across the top of the, of the slide. These are items such as growth of multi-channel retail, polarisation of venues and increasing retail tourism. Now against this backdrop, we've made a clear strategic shift and here we have, you can see, the, shown in the three blocks which ensure the portfolio is aligned to capitalise on these trends. The strategy guides which markets we operate in, focusing on growing consumer markets shown here in blue, how we run our assets, creating differentiated destinations, the second pillar in orange, and how we efficiently source capital to grow, forming strategic partnerships to extend our business. The result is the delivery of consistent income-focused returns. Now let's take a more detailed look at the first column, focusing on growing consumer markets. On, sli on slide five, you see the tactical decisions on market selection have delivered a diversified and enviable pan-European portfolio, which has doubled in size to £10 billion in the last five years. This slide looks at our sector mix, geographic reach and market positioning. We're present in 13 countries around Europe, but we are concentrated in faster growth catchments. When we invest, we look at cities and regions rather than individual countries, cities such as Birmingham, Leeds, Marseille and Dublin. And finally, market positioning. We aim to have the highest growth potential assets within each of our markets. We continuously invest to enhance our centres to ensure they're differentiated and hence able to win market share in their respective catchment. Having outlined our market selection of growing consumer markets, we then actively rotate capital to concentrate the portfolio to 
towards higher growth assets. As an example, five years ago, we had only 1% of our portfolio invested in premium outlets and Ireland. Today, we have 25% in these high growth sectors. So turning to slide six, we have illustrated some key examples of our strategy in action during the past year. With GDP growth set to continue outstripping the rest of Europe, Ireland is clearly within our sweet spot of growing consumer markets. Since taking ownership, we have already realised a 9% uplift in ERV growth at the centre. Now, looking at how we differentiate ourselves, our newest shopping centre, Victoria Gate in Leeds, is a demonstration of a new standard in retail excellence and design. We introduced 17 new retailers to the city, and it now has the largest concentration of full-price aspirational and luxury goods outside of London. The Financial Times called it the Knightsbridge of the North. And looking at the right-hand column, the partnerships we have cultivated in our outlets business are a clear demonstration of the strategy in action. Our premium outlets platform, partnering with Value Retail and APG, is now Europe's largest by value, with consistent sales growth up 8% in 2016, delivering strong returns for our business. Now, I'm pleased to say that this has led to an impressive growth profile, as illustrated by the track record of earnings and valuation performance on this slide. Since 2011, our strategy has delivered compound annual earnings growth of 8.6%, and sector-leading compound dividend growth of 7.7%. And despite the wider macro challenges and headwinds, we are confident that our strategy can continue to deliver in line with the long-term target of 6 to 8% of earnings and dividend growth. And Timon will come on to discuss what underpins our confidence in driving this going forward. And with that, I'll hand over to Timon to do the numbers. Well, thank you, David, and good morning, everybody. I've got five areas to cover this morning in the finance section. A review of the 2016 performance, analysis on valuation trends, an update on our credit ratios, funding capacity, and, as just mentioned, drivers for future growth. But first, let's look at the headline results, and these show attractive performance levels consistent with our long-term targets. We're happy with these numbers in the context of a complex external environment. Net rental income at £346.5 million is up nearly 9% on 2015 due to rents from completed developments, acquisitions and a good like-for-like increase. Adjusted profits up 9.4% on last year, driven by growth in rental income, developments and profits from premium outlets. This translates into an earnings per share figure of 29.2p, a rise of 8.6% on 2015. And our total dividend of 24p a share is up 7.6% year on year. Turning to the balance sheet, the property portfolio is valued at almost £10 billion at December 2016, showing a capital value uplift of 1.1%. NAV per share came out at 739p, up 4.1%, on December 2015, boosted by that increased portfolio valuation. And the loan-to-value ratio of 41% at December 2016 was up three percentage points on the previous year. Going forward, we will update the calculation methodology, which I'll touch on in a moment. But now I'd like to examine trends in rental income. Here I've summarised changes in like-for-like net rental income by sector and by year. And on the left, the chart covers growth in 2016. You can see UK shopping centres generated an uplift of 2.4%, with significant contributions from centres in Birmingham, Aberdeen and Leeds. UK retail parks posted a 2.4% improvement in like-for-like net rental income, with a positive impact from a variety of asset management actions. 
French retail had a good year with uplifts at Marseille and Strasbourg being the main drivers of 2.2% growth, with no help from indexation. And the subtotal 2.2% increase is shown in the blue bar in the center. At the bottom, we've shown premium outlets like flight growth is 7.6%, and that was due to excellent results in Bista Village, Barcelona, and Dublin. Overall, that gives a group total of 3.2% shown in the bottom left. Now, looking at the chart on the right, our five-year track record shows a good progression. Premium outlets in green is included from 2014, the year after we expanded our interest through a variety of deals, and you can see how it boosts the overall group performance. Now let's move on to profit, and on this page we present the adjusted profit walk explaining year-on-year -year changes from last year's reported number of £210.9 million shown in blue on the left. Moving across the chart, light fly NRI growth improved profits by £6.5 million. Net acquisitions and disposals boosted profits by £5.9 million. And the additional rent from completed developments and extensions boosted profits by £5.1 million. Premium outlets contributed to an uplift in profits by £5.9 million, <coughs> driven in particular by a strong performance at Bista Village. And there was a modest year-on-year -year increase in administration expenses, although the overall cost-income ratio fell by 50 basis points to 22.6%. Interest expenses increased marginally by £300,000, mainly as a consequence of higher debt levels. And foreign exchange and other items reduced profits by another three hundred grand. And that takes us to an overall 2016 profit figure of £230.7 million, up an excellent 9.4% on last year's figure. Now, turning to the property valuation, we've segmented the portfolio by sector, and the changes in value are shown in constant currency. I'm going to review the movements in the first column of numbers before addressing the key drivers in the grey box. The largest segment, UK shopping centres, was down very marginally over the year. This was mainly caused by the increase in stamp duty in April, shown in the other column. UK retail parks saw a capital decline of 8.9% in 2016 due to 45 basis points of unfavourable yield movements, the stamp duty impact slightly offset by income growth. In the second half, the valuation decline was 6.1%. In France, our investment portfolio is up 3.6% due to an average 30 basis point of yield compression. And developments were up 7.2% in the year, boosted by schemes in Leeds and Southampton. Premium outlets generated capital growth of almost 10%, of which nearly two-thirds is driven by excellent income growth. Shown in the bottom row is our Ireland portfolio. The amount represents the property values of Dundrum Town Centre, ILAC and Dublin Central. And since we took control of the underlying centres, like-for-like second-half capital of uplift with 0.4%, supported by excellent ERV growth. In the other column, we have the impact of one-off transaction costs as we anticipated. So overall, the total portfolio had a capital return of 1.1% and was valued at just short of £10 billion at December 2016. Now, there have been some requests for more data on maintenance capex, so we show a detailed analysis of shopping centres in the appendix. Moving on to NAV per share, in this walk I illustrate the movement from the value of £7.10 a share at December 2015, shown on the left, and valuation increases in our property portfolio, including outlets, increased now by 16p a share. Adjusted profit contributed 29p a share, and favourable foreign exchange movements and other items boosted now by 9p a share. That was offset by dividends being paid out, reducing now by 25p. So that takes us to a NAV figure on the right of 739p, up 29 pence, or 4.1% in the last year. Shifting to the analysis of debt, our balance sheet remains sturdy and consistent with our financing policies. The December 2016 column in the middle shows total net debt was £3.4 billion, up from the end of 2015 due to development and um, acquisitions. 
Gearing at year-end was 59%, up 5 percentage points on December 2015. The LTV ratio, excluding outlets at December 2016, was 41%. LTV incorporating outlets was 36%, up from 34% a year ago. We had substantial liquidity of nearly £600 million at December 2016. The bottom half of the table looks at some detailed ratios. And as you know, we've been targeting the cost of debt, which has fallen by 70 basis points to 3.1% due to a variety of new bond and bank deals. Interest cover and net debt to EBITDA ratios are very similar to 2015. Foreign exchange hedging policy will continue to be around the 80% level, providing some cushion from foreign exchange volatility. Now, let's take a moment to examine the methodology of the loan-to-value ratio. Over the last five years, our outlet portfolio has grown substantially to reach net assets of £1.2 billion. Traditionally, we calculated LTV excluding the assets and the debt of value retail and via. Several years ago, that was fine, but as outlets have expanded, it is correct to update the LTV calculation. In the table, we show the new approaches to preparing the LTV ratio. The first column of numbers shows our old methodology. As you can see, there is no contribution from value retail or via, giving an LTV ratio of 40.9%, shown in the bottom. The middle column incorporates the net assets of outlets and results in an LTV ratio of 36.2%, as mentioned earlier. The final column splits out the loans and the property values of VIA and value retail using proportional consolidation, which results in a look-through LTV of 39%. Now, it's worth noting that some of our peers use the new methodology incorporating net assets, others use proportional consolidation. We will show both numbers going forward. So the revised LTV ratios take into account the current business composition and makes for easier comparison with our peers. At 36%, it's within our LTV policy. And I'll explain about our disposal and CapEx plans next. As you know, we have a disciplined approach to capital recycling to maintain our balance sheet strength and to support developments and selected acquisitions. So let's look at the disposal program in more detail. Since 2011, we've had an average disposal run rate of around £285 million per annum, and this is shown in the bar on the left. To fund our investments in Dublin and Birmingham, we launched a major program of sales, which is now completed and shown in the second bar. It's noteworthy that the £635 million disposal programme has been sourced from all parts of the business, as you can see from the legend. We've identified a further group of disposal candidates for 2017, and that's expected to raise at least £400 million. Looking forward, in the next five years, the annual average capex of developments and extensions is around £300 million per annum. That's shown in the black bar on the right. We've included all of our large projects, and David will give you more details on development schemes later. So the key message is that development projects can be financed from internal resources as we retain funding flexibility. So next, a look at our advised debt maturities. And this chart shows the position following the funding of our record £400 million US private placement in January 2017. The bar chart illustrates how our maturities are spread evenly over the next 14 years, and there are no significant repayment events until 2019, and substantial flexibility from almost a billion pounds of revolving credit facilities. Look at the box in the top right. We executed 1.2 billion pounds of financing transactions in 2016. We accessed three distinct (coughs) markets, with debt providers ranging from Milwaukee through Frankfurt, to Tokyo. The 500 million euro bond issue is shown in 2023, and the new 420 million pound credit facility shown in 2021, with the private placement deal shown in yellow. So these all help to extend the group's weighted average cost of debt and its maturity. 
future disposals will partly repay the RCF shown in purple in 2021 to further spread the maturity profile. So finally, for me in the finance section, a review of historic and future earnings per share growth. This chart on page 18 shows the 50% increase in earnings per share since 2011 to the 29.2p a share announced this morning. You can see from the bars the key drivers of this significant uplift were like for like NRI growth, developments and extensions, and profit uplifts from premium outlets. Acquisitions and disposals were fairly neutral, whilst we improved portfolio quality. Interest expense was slightly negative, as net debt levels were increased, but partly mitigated by financing at lower rates. There was a modest negative impact from tax, foreign exchange and share issuance, as well as a few other items. Now, importantly, looking forward in the right-hand column, we describe the drivers of future performance, and most of the themes of the last five years remain in place. We expect like-for-like NRI growth of at least 2% per annum. Developments will add to profits through small extensions and major projects. And the secular growth in the outlet market will continue to drive higher earnings. In the near term, profits could be reduced by disposals, but will be a modest impact. And deleveraging and more refinancing will reduce interest costs going forward. So overall, we anticipate continuing EPS and dividend growth as seen over the last five years. So for the time being, that's it from me. And I'll hand back to David. Thanks, Timon. So moving on to our portfolio update and starting with our prime shopping centres in the UK, France and Ireland. Firstly, I want to spend just a minute or two looking at our leasing programmes. Now, we have many priorities in the business, but arguably leasing is our lifeblood. And the golfers in the room uh, might know the very famous quote, drive for show, putt for dough. Well, in our world, this translates to sales for show, leasing for dough, to make the point. Now, in 2016, we saw good demand for space across the portfolio, and our leasing teams concluded over 300 deals, amounting to 142,000 square metres of space. In the UK, this represents £9 million of new leases, and the referendum did nothing to stymie momentum in the second half of the year. In France, despite a tough consumer backdrop, we also achieved £9 million again of new lettings, adding more than 15 new brands to the portfolio. Leasing versus ERV was strong at 6% ahead in the UK and 5% ahead in France. And ERV growth in the UK was up a decent 1.6% and a very strong plus 9% in Ireland, which I'll come on to later. Now, France was impacted by a rebasing of Beauvais to reflect a challenging first year of trading. Although excluding this asset, ERV growth was marginally positive. And to provide a little more colour, through the year, lease incentives were stable. Rent reviews produced uplifts of over 9% and lease renewals were 5% positive. Furthermore, supported by positive Christmas trading and a resilient consumer, retailers are progressing their leasing plans in 2017 and notwithstanding cost pressures, focusing on adding space in prime locations. Now, moving to slide 22, we evaluate the role of physical stores in the multi-channel environment. Our research demonstrates that the productivity of physical stores extends beyond traditional sales measures by some margin. It also explains why we are able to grow rents ahead of reported sales growth. As the diagram shows, in-store sales still account for the vast majority of purchasing activity. But the combination of click and collect, 
purchasing in-store via mobile devices and online returns adds an estimated 10% of incremental sales to the centre. Moving to the second ring, the retail halo effect as we call it, whereby physical store presence builds brand awareness and boosts online sales in a particular catchment area. And that adds a further 5% of sales. And finally, collection kiosks for pure play online retailers hosted by Amazon, Doddle and Collect Plus are responsible for another 1% to 2% of incremental sales. So to recap, we estimate that the uh, space in our centres is 17% more productive for our retailers than the headline sales data suggests. And this supports our rental growth forecasts. Turning now to France... As I said, it's been a mixed picture in terms of consumer sentiment, particularly in Paris, where retail has struggled to recover from recent terrorist attacks. But the latest economic indicators point to an improving environment with consumer sentiment picking up. Against this backdrop, we are pleased that we have outperformed our peer group and national benchmarks, demonstrating that our efforts to transform the portfolio are paying off. This chart on the slide demonstrates our progress, with sales moving from minus 3% to plus 3.1% since 2012, and like-for-like net rental income, excluding any benefit from indexation, of 2.2%. Terras du Port continues to be our best-performing asset, and we continue to recycle capital out of lower-performing assets and invest in refurbishing the core centres where we have identified clear growth drivers. As a result of this core focus, the the shape of our portfolio has shifted, with the top three fully owned assets now accounting for 70% of the French business, and the average lot size growing by 58% over the last five years. These assets have seen decent operational metrics as a result of continued retenanting initiatives. During the current year, we have introduced brands including Mac, Apple, Armani and Coach, all of which are firsts for our French portfolio. And over the last three days, we have refreshed... Three days? Three years even, that would be quick work. Over the last three years, we have refreshed one-fifth of the retail tenant mix. In line with the rest of our business, our asset and property management is largely conducted in-house in Paris, but it remains an efficient operation as fees from co-owners and JV partners cover two-thirds of the cost of the French platform. Looking ahead, we're optimistic about the near-term extension opportunities in Paris at both Sergi and Italy Deux. Now turning to our newest market, Ireland. As I've already touched on, a key part of our strategy is to focus our resources on growing consumer markets. And with the Irish economy set to continue its outperformance in Europe, it's clearly a market that fits with our investment criteria. This combination of buoyant growth, limited supply of high-quality retail space and new retailers entering the market is pushing up prime rents. And CBRE is now forecasting rental growth of 4% in Dublin in 2017 against a European average of 1.9%. Looking now at the progress of our assets specifically. Since acquiring the original loans in October 2015, we have moved quickly to secure ownership of the major assets, closing on the majority in the summer of 2016. Just before the year end, we secured ownership of the ILAC Centre on Henry Street and Pavilions is expected to clear in the first half of this year. That will complete our capital commitments in line with what we set out at acquisition. At the ILAC Centre, we have already started refurbishment works on the Southern Mall, with new retailers signed up for four out of the five units. And at Dundrum, we're appointing a master planner for the second phase of development. Now, at Dundrum, we've moved quickly, as I said, to implement asset management plans for the main shopping mall. Our strong relationships with leading retail and catering brands 
has enabled us to start successfully repositioning the tenant mix, introducing Ireland's first five guys to the lineup and recently completing a full reconfiguration of the food court. In line with our product experience framework, we are starting to roll out initiatives, including the introduction of our Plus app and upgraded digital infrastructure to improve customer services and the overall look and feel of the centre. Overall, though, we have already captured a €6 million step up in ERV growth, and we are on track to realise close to €20 million more in line with our five-year target. Now let's move now to UK retail parks. And turning to slide 29, it's useful to reiterate that the outlook for underlying occupier markets and rental levels remains strong, particularly in our sub-segments. We've deliberately positioned our assets within the higher rental growth sectors, with shopping, hybrid and key homeware parks now representing close to 90% of our portfolio is shown in the pie chart on the right-hand side, a significant upweighting against the general market seen on the left. As a result, we are seeing a good performance in operational metrics, outperforming industry benchmarks. Customer visits are up 2.2%, light-for-light net rental income has increased a healthy 2.4%, and dwell times are up 8%. Now, the drivers for the operational performance a strong occupier markets. And we're seeing a number of trends here. Fashion tenants are pursuing infill opportunities. Homeware retailers are looking to grow portfolios on the back of a strong regional housing market. And food and beverage is playing an ever greater role in the mix. As a result, and as demonstrated by the black line on the chart on the right-hand side of this slide, we are seeing record low vacancy across the portfolio, consistently outperforming market indices. The winning formula for this success is a combination of locational convenience, free parking and the critical mass of retailers. Retail parks are also becoming a crucial support in the multi-channel journey. The click and collect offer at Elliott's Field is a good example of this with Amazon lockers supplementing the in-store capabilities of the major retailers. We're also seeing retail formats become more sophisticated at retail parks, mirroring the shopping centre experience. For example, you can see here the inspiration station at Sophology, where customers are encouraged to incorporate the touch and feel of physical products with digital technologies to create and customise bespoke furniture. Now, turning to slide 32, we continue to recycle the portfolio and reinvest. We are currently on site at four retail park developments, investing over £100 million in the next 12 months to achieve a very attractive yield on cost of over 8%. These developments and extensions are relatively low cost, flexible and form part of our core skill set. And now I'll hand back to time and talk you through the excellent performance in premium outlets. Thank you, David. Yep, I'm back and I'm going to talk about premium outlets. So 2016 was a pivotal year for us in the evolution of our outlet business. And the portfolio with Valley Retail, APG and Mayer Bergman is the largest by value in Europe, with a combined gross asset value of over £5 billion across the 19 centres, as you can see on the map on the left. On the right, we describe significant steps we've taken to enhance our position. We acquired five new outlets in the Via joint venture, reaching our target size and showing strong growth prospects. We've acquired additional shares in Valley Retail for £41 million, taking our overall ownership to over 40% of their net assets. And we've rationalised our interests, resulting in the disposal of our stake in Valley Retail China and the repayment of certain loans to Valley Retail. We increased the resources and the management that Hammerson contributes towards these 
partnerships. So the activities reinforce our commitment to the exciting outlet subsector. So let's take a look at the operational performance. And as you can imagine, we're very pleased with the 2016 results. Year-on-year -year sales growth was in excess of 7% and represents an uptick in the second half of the year. Within our VIA portfolio, we're seeing the early results of retenanting and reconfiguration efforts, with sales entities up 19% and plenty of headroom for future growth. Our exposure to this specialist market remains a strategic advantage for Hammerson, delivering some of the best total returns available in commercial property, as you can see from the bottom row of the table. So what has caused the outperformance that you now know and love from outlets? We describe this in the left-hand column. The trend for international tourism continues unabated. China still dominates in absolute numbers, but as you can see from the pie chart on the top right-hand side, the spread and diversity of tourist spend is increasing, with Middle East, India and USA accounting for around about a quarter. Tax-free sales have grown 6% over the year, and the teams have a full campaign of initiatives ready for 2017. The second trend is the emergence of new retailers into the premium outlet channel. For example, Michael Kors' first outlet store in our village in Madrid, and Toomey's first store in Spain at La Roca in Barcelona. The third point is the intensive brand and retail management deploying specialist skills to drive sales densities through promotions, inventory management, and excellence in customer service. And finally, a selected program of profitable extensions, which I'll touch on next. So here I summarize the three main extensions and reconfiguration projects due to open in 2017, all generating superb returns. On the left, in Amsterdam, we are nearing completion a nearly 7,000 square meter extension, which will boost incremental space by nearly 30% and deliver an expected yield on cost of 11%. In the middle, at Freeport in Portugal, we're on site with a near 9,000 square meter project to lift the quality of the tenant mix, introducing 50 new restaurant and fashion units. Bista Village continues to be the jewel in the crown of the value retail portfolio. Sales are up 20% in the second half of the year, in part helped by the sterling weakness we've experienced since the summer. We remain on track to open phase four of the village by the end of the year, and this will deliver new brands, more car parking, and exceptional visitor experiences. So please, Start saving now for your upcoming trip to Vista Village in October. Back to David. Thanks, Tim. And so moving on to our developments. Remember, these form part of our core strategy, allowing us to grow in our markets, create differentiated destinations at an attractive price point, and extend our retail and partner relationships. Now, Victoria Gate in Leeds was the only major development scheme to open in, U in the UK in 2016, and it was an exceptional launch for Hamson and our retailers. This stunning architecture and high-end brand mix really has set a new standard for retail in the UK, and is a perfect demonstration of our focus and differentiation. If you haven't yet seen it, please go as soon as you can. Together with the Victoria Quarter, the Victoria State now offers over 50,000 square metres of luxury retail space, including the largest John Lewis outside of London, which we understand was their most successful launch ever. And the new casino opened last month, and our new D&D &D rooftop restaurants will open in the spring. Now moving on to Watermark, the dining and leisure-led scheme marked an exciting first for Hammerson. We were delighted to extend our joint venture agreement with GIC across the extended West Quay asset. Now, introducing over 20 new restaurants, most of them firsts for Southampton, 
The development is a great example of placemaking, which, together with West Quay Shopping Centre, has reinforced its position as the South Coast retail and leisure destination. And turning now to our major pipeline developments projects. Plans at Brent Cross are on track and progressing well, and we remain excited about the truly transformational potential of this scheme to create the next generation of retail in London. During 2016, the CPO inquiry was concluded and we await confirmation of CPO powers by the summer of this year. We also advanced the scheme design and we remain on track to submit detailed plans next month. Assuming a determination of detailed planning in the summer, we expect to be in a position to start on site in 2018. And this slide provides a brief summary of our other pipeline developments. In Paris, we're making good progress on plans for a new 28,000 square metre extension at Sergi, which forms part of a wider city regeneration project. Now here, pre-lettings are well advanced and we are already in contractor negotiations. In Croydon, we submitted an enhanced outline planning application in October which incorporates a third level of retail and leisure space with plans for 200 stores overall, including a new full-line M&S store. We're working to achieve planning consent in the first half of this year. At the Goods Yard in Shoreditch, subsequent to the Mayor's deferral, we remain in dialogue with the GLA to address outstanding issues and expect to submit revisions to the scheme in the coming months. So to conclude, 2016 has delivered another year of positive financial returns for the company. We grew our portfolio and with an active capital recycling strategy, we also continued to enhance the overall quality of our assets, focusing on prime retail in growing catchments. With a diversified portfolio, we now have multiple drivers for growth and hence I'm confident that our business will continue to outperform with income-focused returns for shareholders. And with that, I will hand over to you for your questions. Now, I think we have some roving mics. Who would like to go first? Uh, Good morning. This is Ollie Creasy from Green Street. A couple of questions uh, from me, please. I'll uh, give you the first one um, and let you answer. Um, Just looking at your large-scale developments, um, you've given us some indication of earlier start times and and so on. Um, I'm just curious, is is there any information you can give us on maybe um, your expected start times there and how the the major schemes are going to interact with one another in terms of timing um, and whether the costs um, that you're likely to incur are expected to change if if those times are differing, uh, sorry, if they differ given that um, exchange rates are going to move and so on? Um, well, I'll, I'll talk generally about the cost uh, and perhaps ask Peter to talk about the sort of next steps, if you like, in phasing terms. Um, if you look at our total pipeline of developments, it's about $1.5 billion. We've guided about the annual run rate of that going forwards. In our plans, we factor in any inflationary cost expectations for those numbers, so the inflation is built into those figures. Um, we are expecting those schemes to be on site in 2018. So we're very comfortable with the cost figures. Any changes to the um, phasing, in fact, over the next 24 months, we're not expecting a huge amount of inflation in London anyway. That's really a scheme sort of uh, finish elsewhere and you get more capacity from a, um, a labour market. So we're quite comfortable with the overall tone of capital spend and targets. Peter, do you want to say anything more on the schemes themselves? Uh, I think, um, as you see, we, we phase the development pipeline very carefully, looking at the market externally, looking at how Hammers positioned and how the retail market is. So you, Leeds and West Key were very good projects finished last year. This year is about a quick developed retail park projects, £100 million pounds produce good yield. And next year then is about making decisions on those major projects. Uh, so I think at the moment, Brent Cross, you see, you'll see progress, further progress in the next few months on the planning application for the scheme. We're in retail discussions this year as well. If those progress well, 2018 will be well placed, and we are starting construction and contractor engagements as well. Sergi, we're working up quite quickly. 
Again, that could be a decision for later this year, earlier next year, um, and that will enhance Sergi as a, well, a third major asset in France. And Croydon, you've seen, we put a plan, the application in now for a new, brand new Marks and Spencer store, rather than refurbishment we were before. We want consent for that mid this year, and then Croydon will make further decisions on later this year. Um, so I guess in terms of sort of order of progressing, brain crosses in the hopper to work through. Sergi, we're looking at the de-risking it, and Croydon, we need more consents and pieces to pull together. Um, but obviously, we will make those decisions carefully as we do disposals, as we look at the market, and as to, when we're satisfied, returns are acceptable. I mean, just to be clear, we have the financial capacity to undertake these developments as we've programmed. The micro-timing will really depend on our progress with the milestones, and tenant discussions and so on, and that may vary by you know, six months or so. That's great, thank you. Um, second question, just on um, UK shopping centre valuations. Um, I think in the press release this morning you said that um, you identified two prime transactions that had occurred in, in 2016. Um, first one was uh, Grand Central, which obviously quite a long time ago now, um, and the second was Mary Hill, um, which transacted some way below book value. I'm just wondering if you can help us understand the discussions you had with valuers um, where your shopping centre uh, value is largely unchanged, um, but the, the sort of limited but fairly weak transactional evidence is, is pointing downwards. Um, how, how do those... Well, I, I don't are? agree with it's pointing downwards. You've, you've picked one transaction. There are a number of other transactions and what our valuers do. Remember, this is an independent valuation. It's not our valuation. They are light at this figure. But looking at the demand generally for shopping centres, for transactions that have taken place, they take account of slightly weaker centres in terms of a price point. Uh, they even look at the European market as well, and they were confident with these figures. So, um, you know, I can't really add any more colour than that. It is an independent figure. Um, they were obviously very comfortable with it. I think the other point to say is that there are one or two transactions in the pipeline, discussions ongoing in the market, and our intelligence is that those figures uh, or those transactions would underpin these values. Um, morning, David Prescott from Barclays. Uh, just two questions from me. Um, you disclose uh, further on in your uh, reports, an occupancy cost ratio for your UK shopping centres of just over 20%. Uh, I was wondering if you can give us some guidance as to the range of that across your centres and also where that might be for retail parks. Well, let me say a few things about um, OCRs. As I alluded in my uh, fairly poor golfing analogy as well, um, I thought it was quite good, um, <laughs> OCRs are less of a guide than they historically were. We put a very clear slide up to explain how the productivity of our centres and asset or units are much greater, approaching 20% than the headline numbers. So that OCR, of course it's something we monitor, but it is not right to compare an OCR today with an OCR of five years ago. They're not comparable. So we should just take 20% of where OCRs are to compare where they have been... That would be a fairly sensible um, assumption. In terms of the range, um, the, broadly, it really depends where an asset is in its life cycle. So rent review cycles will obviously increase an OCR. So you tend to see a declining OCR heading towards a cycle of rent reviews and lease renewals, and then it jumps up again. So overall, there's no, no sort of strategic imbalance other than that timing effect. What I would say, though, is that within a centre, again, you know, we have OCRs from low single digit to high double digit, depending on the nature of the retailer, whether they are effectively selling their own goods with a very high gross margin or selling branded goods with a lower gross margin will affect their ability to pay. So if you look at, for example, jewellers, they have a very low OCR rate. Department stores have a very low OCR rate. Fashion retailers have a slightly higher. But, you know, it, it is, unfortunately, we, we want to publish a single figure, that's what we do, but my message is don't look at it in isolation. Sure. Um, and maybe just a, a second question. 
There's been a lot in the press recently about business rates rises, obviously, across your whole portfolio. I imagine that doesn't have much of an impact. Uh, but BISTA, where there's been uh, some exceptional growth, uh, do we have any guide to the magnitude of what business rate increase is going to be? And, and do you think that's going to slow growth, or is it something they can just kind of swallow going forward? Well, you're right in our portfolio generally, um, because it's a national diversified portfolio, actually the increase, the change is, is relatively modest. It's almost no change. Um, we've seen a slight increase in our car park rateable values because car park revenues have continued to increase. Uh, Bista, you're right, will see an increase, um, still subject to final verification and could well be some appeals there. But really, Bista is a down to productivity. More people spending more money equals higher income streams, leads to a higher um, rateable value. But in certainly that instance, it's a case of, as I say, improved productivity leads to a higher rate of tax. So, um, you know, that is being finalised, but it would probably be at the higher end. But it's not the, it's not the only location. I, many locations in the South East and London are experiencing similar increases. Yeah. But I think, I mean, the key point here is our feeling of the unjust nature of rates. Uh, I'll just get on my soapbox. <laughs> but um, it really is an outdated tax form, and it certainly doesn't help conventional retailers versus online retailers retailing. Uh, and I think, frankly, the Treasury need to undertake a full review of rates generally. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot in the press. Is there, is there a chance that there is going to be a review of this and, and there's going to be something that happens here? I live in hope, but it's a complex nature. It's a very attractive tax. I had a personal conversation with George Osborne a couple of weeks ago and asked if, in hindsight, he felt there'd been too much focus on corporation tax and not enough on direct taxes like rates. And his answer was, well, rates are very easy to, um, to, to recover. And I really thought that was sort of missing the point. You know, they've got to try harder to capture the true value of online retailing in tax terms. Great. Thank you. Hi. Um, Chris Fremantle from Morgan Stanley. Um, you've made... Um, some commentary over recent years sort of defending uh, the performance of retail parks in the context of your broader portfolio. Um, and obviously you've seen that, that, that performance in value terms at least um, diverge this year. Um, do you see that valuation performance um, as a, as a one-off in 2016? Do you think, uh, do, you know, would you expect the retail parks to continue to be relatively weak in a, on, a, on a sort of total return basis going forward? Uh, I think we've seen the lion's share of the repricing, um, Chris. Uh, what I would say is the occupational markets remain strong. You know, our increase in net rental income over 2%, the number of figures we put in here about leasing activity, uh, dwell time and the like is positive. So we're firmly supporting this sector. Um, I think that 2017 will be flat to marginally negative in terms of valuation. In terms of total return, I would hope that it would produce a positive total return in 2017. Is that on the right? Morning. Uh, Remco Simon, Kemben. Um, Simon, you mentioned you expect to continue to drive um, uh, earnings and dividend growth over the next coming years um, uh, in line with the, the performance that you've had over the last few years and you pointed to the last five years. Um, could I just um, uh, challenge you a little bit? What is the time frame that you expect to be able to maintain that growth rate for? Is that a, a five-year forecast looking back at the at the five years um, on the slide that you did on slide 18, or is it is a slightly shorter term? Thanks, Remco. Um, why don't we go to page seven, please? <laughs> Clearly, we have our own internal business plans. We make our own assumptions, and mm -hmm. because we're a listed company, I have to be very careful what I say. But I'd like you to look at this uh, history and imagine that the dates changed and they were looking in the future. I'd like you to think about the orderly progression of earnings and dividends. 
Unfortunately, Amazon is a well-regarded, well-resourced business with high market shares in its chosen markets. David has explained those markets offer growth opportunities. And therefore, we have the flexibility to move things around so that we can deliver this sort of growth. And I would say that over the forecasting horizon, our expected growth in earnings and in dividends is going to be pretty even. So it's not talking about huge growth in 2022. What we're looking to do is manage an orderly growth in earnings and dividends because we think that's appropriate for our kind of low-risk business and we think that's the investment case that we offer to shareholders. So the purpose of the, the slide which show you the different levers is to display how we can alter things so we can grow organically, we can grow through extensions, we can grow uh, through outlets, but also manage the capital base through disposals. And that means that the consistent growth in earnings, we believe, will continue. Uh, Morning, guys. Uh, Mike Bessel from Bank of America. Just quickly on, David, your comment that you can fund the developments through financial resources. Uh, You've highlighted 400 million of potential disposals this year um, against 1.5 million to spend, uh, 1.5 billion to spend. Firstly, um, there looks to be about 150 million of sort of uh, more general warehouse and solace assets in the retail parks. Should we assume that they're in the disposal pipeline? And also, Going forwards, how should we think about the impact of that funding on net debt? Further disposals, will they take the form of entire asset sales or more joint venturing? Well, if you um, perhaps remind you, page 16 is a um, a good place just to look at this in more detail. Um, When we talk about CapEx going forwards, yes, the day-to-day CapEx on extension to at our retail parks is included in that. Um, 300 million per annum over the five-year period. Uh, We're targeting over 400 million this year. I would remind you again that on average, we have tended to sell almost 300 million pounds in terms of our capital recycling and our ability to increase um, overall um, uh, the, the, the performance of the business. But I think, you know, what you will see if, if we have a, you know, by varying measures now, an LTV of between 36 and 41%, you would see that decline marginally over the same period. So if that gives you a, an answer in terms of net debt. But the business will keep growing. Um, so um, overall, each of the actual net debt, NAV, and uh, gross assets will rise, but as a proportion, net debt will fall. Anything to add to that, Tom? No, I think it's going to come from a variety of sources, Mike, as we've displayed in the legend on page 16. Yeah, there could be joint ventures, there could be individual asset yeah. sales. You know, we're talking about selling 4% of the, of the portfolio. £10 billion, £400 million, 4%. I think that's manageable. Uh, Michael, B- <clears throat> Michael Bird, ex BNP Paribas. Um, set a question on rental value growth. Uh, previously, you've guided pre-referendum to rental value growth for you UK shopping centres of in the order of 2 to 3% per annum. You've talked about sort of, I guess, the ongoing demand you're still seeing from retailers. Do you still think that that forecast is valid going forwards? That's certainly our target, Mike. Um, we've, we've just slightly come in below that this year, although the second half at 1.1% was positive. It, we had a slower first half of the year. So the run rate is on on track with our target. So I have no reason to shift um, our forecast. Um, and that's that's what we're targeting, 2 to 3%. And just in terms of rental value growth in France, I mean, it's a relatively weak year this year. I mean, you explained that was asset specific to a certain extent. I mean, do you see prospects for rental value growth in France improving going forwards? Um, yes. I mean, I think, remember, as we said, we have con- continue to focus on our core assets, particularly our larger three assets. Um, there, in those, sales have been quite strong, particularly driven by terrorist de poor. Retail demand is good. Uh, we were hit, as you know, this year by a rebasing of uh, Beauvais. 
so broadly flat ERVs um, without that figure. But I, I think, yes, the, the, there are reasons why we, we should deliver stronger ERV growth going forwards. Jean-Philippe, do you want to add any colour to the French market right now? No, uh, um, except um, Jeux de Paume and Beauvais, all the centres were positive, uh, marginally. Uh, we strongly believe, as uh, David pointed out, that the three main assets, which are Sergi, Italy 2 and uh, Terra Zuport, uh, with the asset management initiatives that we are contemplating through extensions, will enable to grow ERV uh, in a larger scale than this year. Mark Mozzi from, uh, from Sartgen. Um, just a follow-up on Chris's uh, question about the yield shift on the retail parks. So I understand that you've got a uh, 50, 50 bips yield shift and you, are, you have probably the best uh, um, asset in the, in the UK. Would you say that the other assets across the UK have suffered from a larger yield shift than you did? Or put it the other way around, why do you think you suffered from s such a large yield shift? It's, it's simple market it comes down to lot size um, unfortunately what we've suffered from is having the best assets and that really is important from a occupier base driving footfall as we've seen the dwell time the sales all very positive mm -hmm. but those larger lot size were less attractive to the market than smaller lot sizes so perhaps somewhat counterintuitively from a occupational point of view, operational point of view, the larger, better assets suffered more than smaller assets. So, yeah, we, we think that our assets have probably underperformed the wider market. But, you know, we don't run the business for 12 months. It's about longer-term performance. I firmly believe we have the right assets in the right locations, and you can see that in the operational metrics. Okay, makes sense. Um, back on the, on the LTV, um, I would like to understand what has been the rationals behind this change of calculation, and more importantly, why you did choose to choose the less relevant, economically speaking, calculation, meaning excluding the net debt coming from the uh, equity method uh, asset, which for me, it's a kind of a weird uh, way of calculating the net debt on an economic point of view. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah, so we're on page 15. Um, so first of all, why have we changed? Um, well, it's because there's nothing in the old methodology for outlets. And as I mentioned, £1.2 billion worth of net assets is pretty sizable in the context of the company. So we didn't feel it, it was sensible to exclude those assets. Um, then on the right-hand side of page 15, we got a choice. Um, the new methodology includes the, the net assets from those investments. By the way, that's consistent with the way one of our credit rating agencies approach it and also consistent with a, a large French-based um, retail property company. I'm sure you can work out which one. Um, there's no intangible assets in here, by the way, so that's maybe a bit of a difference. And on the right, fully proportionally consolidated is consistent with um, the approach many of our UK peers take, including one that announced on Friday and one that's based in Seymour Street. So, hey, what we've done as always... You feel more always, French than, uh, than UK, then? Pardon? You feel more French than UK on that type? We are very international as Hammerson, mm -hmm. so we've offered you different alternatives. As I say, we're going to disclose the different measures. But, look, the message is... We are going to deleverage, as David said. We're going to be selling more properties than we're going to be investing this year. We think that's appropriate, um, and that gives us flexibility to grow the business through the exciting developments Peter's mentioned. So, what's on, what sort of uh, LTV guidance do you consider now on this new? That's not 36 changed. Basis? It's it's up to forty percent. I think we feel comfortable in the mid thirties to forty percent. That's the zone, Mark. To be clear, Mark, as well, this is a disclosure point. What we're trying to do is give a clearer review and a see-through review of the company's finances rather than the change of strategy. Don't think we're going to do anything different as a result of this lower figure. As Tom said, we're, we're looking to marginally delever, but the target remains below 40. And maybe just a last one. Um, you acquired, if I'm correct, 112 million sterling of VR plus uh, VR outlets. 
what sort of uh, yield on cost, uh, yield on initial yields, sorry, should we, should we, should we uh, expect on that? Um, I think we've disclosed the yield on the VIA acquisitions, and that is around about 5.5% initial yield. Um, we didn't disclose the value retail interest. They're actually at the holding company, so it's like buying shares. But the see-through yield of our big value retail assets are in the same sort of zone, high 5% which, you know, offers some pretty good income returns. Thank you. Right, I think that looks like it covers questions in the room. Um, we can now just see if there are any questions over the phone lines. Please press star 1 to ask a question. We'll now take our first question from the phone. It comes from Marcus Fairmudge from BMO Global Asset Management. Please go ahead, your line is open. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, gents. Um, just coming back on your answer to Mark Mozzie's question on the retail parks, I'm clear you felt that the valuation had adjusted more aggressively because your parks were a better quality than the broader market. I um, just want to be sure about that. Was, was it a function of lot size? Was that the yeah. So, Mark, good morning. Yeah, the lot size was the impact. Um, I would say if you look at the parks that were sold were bigger and the weaker demand was at that large lot size. So those values have fallen more significantly than uh, smaller lot size. So it's the lot size is the, is the impact point. But interestingly, that hasn't, there's been no read across to your shopping centres, which are also clearly the majority of them are very good value. So that's, a, that's an interesting point. I'll take that away. Just staying with the retail park, I mean, you, you point out that the valuation is very much independent, and, but you guys are then on the, on the cross of, of, of your valuers continuing to overvalue product in what is really a very difficult market. I mean, Thanet's been on the market for quite a long time now. Clearly, you've got a new valuation. You've set a new value. Are you confident that it, it's now that those sort of assets are now properly valued and you are going to be able to shift them as part of your 400 million? Not necessarily that particular property, although that clearly you, you have been wanting to sell it. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, and just to finish off your observation uh, at the end there, uh, we feel very confident about the shopping centres. Quite a different marketplace for shopping centres, particularly sovereign wealth and more global investors, whereas the uh, retail parks are quite a domestic market, as you know. Um, but no, in terms of the retail parks, we've seen the valuation falls. Um, I'm confident that the values are now appropriate. Um, as much as I also answered a previous question, I said that there may be some marginal softening in values in 2017, but you know, we'll see as the year unfolds. Okay, thank you. And my, my other question is relating to page 54 on the appendix, um, portfolio leasing overviews, tremendous numbers, um, leasing versus ERV. But we come to the forever thorny issue of incentives. Of that 9 million of new rents, it was secu rent secured from new leases, is that, that's an annualized figure not adjusted for rent free. I mean, put it in extremists, if you were to let one unit for nine million and to give away a year's rent free, then that you would then we would then need to adjust that number accordingly over the life of the lease. Or is that so is that a net of incentive figure or is that a, a headline figure ignoring incentives? That is a headline figure. That is generally the market practice. But to reassure you in our prime centres leasing incentives haven't really changed and three to six months is very much the average run rate of incentives that we're we're giving on a uh, 10 year lease okay so it's in the leasing figure but it's not in the actual erv itself because the erv is a per foot figure the ERV. so one is a gross no, one is the, a gross of incentive the other is a net is that right uh, the ERV will be effectively a net figure because it's established by the valuers and they do take account of the incentives. They do. It's not just... A, it's not just... OK, fine. Lovely. Thank you very much. OK. There are no further questions from the phone, but again, as a reminder, please press star 1. As there are no further questions, I'll now turn the call back to your host. 
OK, well, I think that um, pretty much wraps up. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, as you know, we always try and end um, with a, a little video, so if you can just remain in your seats for a moment. Um, one way we're benefiting from the rise in technology um, and shaping and shopping is through uh, our app, our Plus app I mentioned earlier on. Uh, we introduce this across our portfolio uh, in the year, so it's present in every single one of our shopping centres and we've actually been trialling new functionality to really bring the best of physical and digital together. We've been partnering with a company called Cortexica and we've introduced proprietary technology which in effect allows you to take a photograph of an actual uh, fashion item or a picture and then when you're in one of our shopping centres press the search button and it will tell you which shops are stocking items similar to the ones you've um, uh, requested. You can then change colour, shape, size, design, whatever you like. And we think, you know, in a way of taking some of that heartache out of shopping, um, it's very positive. Uh, early results are, are very encouraging. 90% of shoppers using the app say it would encourage them to visit a greater number of stores more frequently. So you'll be able to use it in our centres later this year, but for the, second, for the moment, let's have a look at the video to explain it. <laughs> 